This is March 22nd, 2010, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Terry Brown served in the United States Army from October 4th, 1968 to March 3rd, 1998. This interview is being conducted in Albany, New York by Kenneth and June Hunter. Please state your full name and when and where you were born. Uh, Terrence Terry Brown, I was born in Albany, New York. And what did you do before you entered the Army? I uh, worked at the Albany Times Union as a copy boy and was a part-time student at Siena College. All right. Now, why did you enter the Army and where did you report for basic training? Um, I was drafted while I was transferring from Albany uh, from uh, Siena College to a state college. I couldn't afford Siena. Um, I was financing my own, own way through college. Once I got the draft notice, I said, well, um, I'll go ahead and do my duty, then make them pay for my college. <laughs> and so then I went to uh, basic training at Fort Dix, and very good training. It was basic combat training. Uh, taught me how to be an infantryman and survive battles. From there, uh, I was assigned to advanced indiv the individual infantry training at Fort Pope, but there was a slight disruption from that in that a bunch of us were pulled out to go to a leadership preparation school. They looked at our records and noticed some folks who, who like me, had uh, completed ROTC training, and so uh, they wanted to train us to be leaders during the AIT training. So at Fort Pope, we had further uh, excellent training. Uh, we made a transition from M14 to M16 rifles. And I'm glad because the M14 rifle is heavier. And, and then when we uh, graduated from AIT at Fort Pope, we, we thought, well, we're going to go to Vietnam. We're just going to grab our orders, take some time off, and go. But instead, we got orders to go to uh, go to Fort Knox to train to become APC, Armored Personnel Carrier Crewman. So we reported to Fort Knox and underwent three weeks of training on APCs and, and associated weapons. And then upon graduation, we were given our orders for Vietnam and given two weeks off. So during that two week period, five days before uh, reporting to go to Vietnam, I was married. And uh, after marriage, reported to Oakland Army Terminal to be processed and to be flown to Vietnam. So that's about April 19. So I arrived in Vietnam and we spent five days of P training, preparatory training. Uh, they took you out in the jungle and villages, etc., to, to get you acclimated and trained, teach you what to look for by ways of signs of enemy activity. The enemy, Vietnam, Viet Cong, and North Vietnamese Army folks uh, were very lucid and, and good at blending with the environment. And then we were sent to Benoit uh, to wait our permanent unit assignment. There were 34 of us in the bleachers when a chaplain came out, looked at us, and says, Welcome. Poof, you're all airborne. We were all assigned to the 101st Airborne Division. We said, Uh oh, they don't have armor. Oh, sounds like we're going to be infantrymen. We're going to be jumping out of something. <laughs> <laughs> so we all went to our individual units. Uh, when we got to Camp Evans, we were allowed to pick our company units. I picked Charlie Company. And so I was assigned to Charlie Company. And we spent a few days at Camp Evans Base Camp, uh, further fortifying the uh, perimeter, uh, 
building bunkers. And before we were transported out to our unit uh, outside of Benoit. At that time, uh, my platoon was guarding a, a, a bridge at uh, Anlo River. And we were there for about two weeks. And during the day, we often would go out and patrols into the low, uh, lowlands of the Yeshaw Valley look for enemy activity and, and do ambushes. Fortunately, during that time, there was no enemy act, uh, uh, contact. Uh, and then we were assigned to, the, the entire battalion got together outside of Phuong Dien in this flatland. Uh, we were flown into the Aishaw Valley and to a place called Firebase Blaze. And and then we had to wait further helicopters to fly us to Firebase Airborne. And because of the time of the day it got dark, we we missed out going to Firebase Airborne that day, which was fortunate for us because Firebase Airborne was attacked that night and they suffered about 42 killed in action and a couple dozen wounded. So we would have been a party to that. So. Upon arrival at the uh, Firebase Airborne, we were dispatched to the Aishaw Valley floor to begin daily combat patrols. And we all became part of the uh, famous battle of Hamburger Hill uh, cleanup operation. And our first combat assault was started off with an interesting note with the commander alerting medevac helicopters to be on standby as we were about to assault this hill. We assaulted the hill. Uh, fortunately, had, the enemy had left, and so we decided to spend the night there. We set up a night de defensive position. And as I was uh, digging a little bunker, I kept hitting metal. <laughs> and uh, so I I dug a little bit further, but cautiously, in the event that it was a mine. It turned out that it was a case of uh, AK-47 bullets. And I dug further and found some more cases. And I alerted the commander, and so each, each soldier, as they were digging their ninth posi position, uh, found enemy weapons and, and bullets, including AK-47s. Yeah. I'll just check your email. And, and uh, so then that changed our mission. And our headquarters signed us to search the area for enemy, signs of enemy activity uh, and supply. And so for the next six weeks, we searched and we found uh, cases, probably more than 100 cases of brand new rifles. RP, R, Rocket Patel grenade launchers, RPG rounds, AK-47 uh, bullets, hand grenades, mines, and 100 tons of rice. So we were tasked to destroy it all because there was so much we couldn't fly it. We couldn't fly it back to base camp or elsewhere. So our mission was to destroy it. So that that was a, a pretty good uh, productive mission. Sometimes at night we go out on squad patrols and ambushes, uh, and every once in a while we get a urgent call uh, to search for a helicopter that was just shot down. And on several occasions we located the helicopter uh, during uh, at one site. Both the pilots w were were dead, so we recovered the remains. And another uh, gunship site. Uh, we recovered uh, a pilot who was wounded, severe leg wound, and his co-pilot who was dead. And so we recovered both of them. We got the wounded to medical aid station quick. Um, and then there was a third one. Um, there, there was no, there were no survivors. Then, at, and then during several of our patrols, we got hit with sniper fire. And we responded, and we didn't take casualties during those sniper attacks. Uh, 
we just kind of like moved to low ground pretty quick. Uh, we were doing this for 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 weeks, and and then at a at a forty second day period, I vividly remember we checked out a hilltop, and it seemed pretty secure, and uh, it was. So we took off our, our boots and our socks for the first time in weeks to air them out. A sniper attack opened up on us. So I drove into a nearby thickly vegetated uh, growth and I stubbed my toe. And it was painful, but I uh, didn't think anything of it and let it go. But unbeknownst to me, uh, somehow I got jungle rot and some kind of jungle infection. So a few months later that became problematic. So we continued on our mission and uh, and then we were, we, we were given a break to provide security on top of Firebase Airborne, give us three days of R&R, &R, but at night we have to uh, be on guard in case of enemy attack and sometimes send out patrols. And that was a nice little respite, and and then we were sent back out on patrols. And then for some reason we were all the whole battalion was flown back into the phone den area outside of at a outside of uh, Camp Evans. Uh, we did nightly ambushes, and then after about a week, we went back to our base camp for about three days. Then they sent us back on out on patrols where the was a lot of enemy activity at night and where they thought mortars were being fired at us. And uh, so suddenly uh, the commander gets, you know, hel uh, command helicopter comes in with the division commander, briefs the commander, then suddenly a couple of helicopters come in with hot meals and ice cream. You know, all during this period we're eating wonderful, not so wonderful sea rations and funky water, drinking funky water. But anyways, we're given a hot meal. It's hot, it was tasty, and ice cream, which was very rare, in the, in, especially near, near the jungle like that. But I had a suspicion about that. My suspicion was correct. Anytime they do that, it's like a stand out just before they send you on a major mission. So they send us on a really, really major mission. Uh, there were apparently intelligence had indicated huge number of enemy forces were moving through the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail near the Laotian border, uh, northern part of the Aishaw Valley. So we were sent there. First few days were uh, n uh, nothing happened. It did rain a lot. It actually got down to about 40, 42 degrees at night. And, and sometimes we literally slept in the mud. But anyway, this one, one day, our worst day, uh, we took a break for lunch, put out security, then it came time for us to uh, to join in another unit that had just made contact with the enemy. When we started our move out, we were ambushed, and we took very severe casualties. Uh, uh, the first soldier we hit was killed instantly, and that battle lasted about three hours, and we ended up with 42 out of 128 surviving. And in my squad of 12 people, only five survived. And in our platoon of, uh, of 42 soldiers, uh, 12 survived. And once that battle was over, uh, we gathered our wounded and treated them as best we can, we waited for medevacs as the uh, Navy Marines provided air air support. Uh, fortunately, one of my buddies who I was, uh, who had a sunken chest wound, I was caring and trying to prevent him from going into shock. Uh, he was very severely wounded. He died in my arms. And so that was a really, really sad, bad moment that troubles me to this day. So. Uh, after after our, we evacuated our wounded and our dead, we moved on to take a hilltop. And as we're going along, we kept finding enemy bodies. Uh, 
So it, it showed that this battle was quite, covered quite a, quite a big area. And I later learned that uh, two, two 101st Airborne Division battalions were ambushed um, and even high-ranking officers were killed, including a, a battalion commander, the 1st Battalion, 506 Infantry. And we, we, uh, we secured a hilltop and we're still finding and burying enemy soldiers' bodies. And, and uh, so we were there for about three days. We operated out of this hilltop. We did uh, daily patrols looking for more enemy uh, activity, etc. It was during this t time that I had gotten, my company had gotten a radio message from headquarters wanting me to go to the base camp to be interviewed for an army reporter job. <laughs> and so uh, it was quite an exciting day for me. And the commander says, when this resupply helicopter comes in, you board it and you go to the base camp. It looks like you're, you're going to be an army reporter covering our battalion. And, and, uh, you, and, and the commander wished me the best. And when I boarded that helicopter, and all my call soldiers were waving at me with the V fingers. And the V is to get, that's a very important, it means a lot of things. It means wish you the best, peace, and you're moving out of harm's way, and that's great. And so I did my V back. I was interviewed and immediately assigned to cover this battalion, and so I spent the next six months as an army reporter. And I was a very maverick army reporter. And a lot of the army reporters with the 101st made a point to avoid going out with the, uh, with the, with the uh, soldiers, combat patrols. They made it a point to go out with uh, the infantrymen at least twice a week. Wherever missions they went out, I went out with. And, and consequently, that paid dividends. Uh, wherever I went, I was welcome. And, and everybody was quite cooperative and willing to give me whatever information I needed to write stories and, and take photographs. Whereas a lot of the other army reporters basically operated out of base camps and never left base camp. And so I became a real honest and true combat reporter. And several times when I was out with units, we got, we made enemy contact and, and and uh, the folks who are covering were very glad that I joined and helped defending their position. But also they noted that I was wearing a combat infantry badge to, and that's very important, one of the most prestigious thing an infantryman can have. And it, it communicates to other soldiers that you're in combat, you're a combat soldier, and you were shot at and you survived. And so that commands a lot of respect from other folks. And that's something that I wore the rest of my military career. And, and I noticed the, the respect that that garnered. So now, in December, my wife had a baby. She had complications. There was a, a blood problem. And, and the baby was breached. And as I was trying to make arrangements to go out to a unit in the field, my first sergeant comes running and says, Hey, Specialist Brown, Specialist Brown, uh, he was yelling, got good news and bad news. Good news first, you're the father of a six pound, seven ounce healthy boy, but your wife is quite ill. Red Cross request you go home on emergency leave. And so, so then I uh, hitched a ride from Camp Evans uh, to Fubai, about 35 miles away, boarded a Herky Bird C-130, flew to Cameron Bay. Now, this all this was all going on on Christmas Eve. So at Cameron Bay, I got manifested for an emergency flight back to the States. We had to wait two hours for that chartered flight. We left Christmas. We left. Cameron Bay, we left the war zone Christmas morning at 1 a.m. 
There's 138 of us on this plane. We were not a happy bunch. Uh, all the other soldiers either had emergency medical problems or, or death in the family. And so as we were f flying to land uh, in, uh, in Seattle, Washington, a stewardess tried to cheer us up and to try to get us to sing Christmas carols. We would not sing Christmas carols. We were not in the mood. They did, did down, they tried valiantly. But, but the moment the plane landed on U.S. soil, we all screamed and yelled and cheered and clapped. And that kind of brought tears to the flight crew's eyes. But, so we immediately went to Fort Lewis, processed, and we were sent home on emergency to our homes. I arrived at Albany Airport on Christmas night at 8 a.m. Snowflakes were falling right in the middle of a 42-inch back-to-back snowstorm. It was the very last flight to get to Albany County Airport for three days. And so my wife's uncle drove me to St. Peter's Hospital. We got there about 9.30. And the hospital had given me permission to visit at any time I got there. But as I was walking through the hallways, uh, I noticed that there were very, f in different wards, there were very few nurses there. This just didn't seem right. because it, I, And then when I got to my wife's room, the hallways filled with, was filled with nurses. They wanted to be there uh, because my wife didn't know I was coming. <laughs> Christmas night, I showed up. That was heartwarming. So anyways, so after the emergency leave, um, I, I, I rejoined my unit. I assume your wife survived and everything? Yes, and I'm very healthy and the son has just turned 40. Wow. And uh, she's doing quite well too. And uh, so I returned to my unit and went mission oriented pretty quick. I love going to the field with the soldiers. That was my favorite part of my Army reporter mission, being out with the soldiers uh, on on a, on a combat missions, search and clear, and uh, security missions, and sometimes uh, uh, help the local citizens to include civil affairs programs, uh, like help build uh, running water systems, uh, provide security for Army medical folks to uh, give care to the poor local uh, Vietnamese folks. So the rest of the tour is pretty pretty good. Not, uh, some minor contacts, a lot of rocket mortar attacks. Um, and, uh, but I will like to add a little bit of humor. When I first was assigned as an re Army reporter, I was assigned to the to Brigade PIO hoops where they had real beds. I mean, bring beds. That's all everybody else slept on cots. For, for those that don't know, what is PIO? Public Information Office. And there was a, and they had a refrigerator, an electric refrigerator, and that was really like being a millionaire. And you, so you had cold salt sodas all the time. And uh, so this, my, uh, the battalion commander, uh, uh, the, uh, the commander of the battalion, I was covering wanted his uh, soldiers all to live in the battalion area so so I said, so he ordered me to uh, to stay at the headquarters hoops so okay but they had cots and I had a real bed and so so I remember so there was a three-quarter uh, ambulance it had a red cross on it no one was around, and so I borrowed it. And so I took the bed part, put it in the back of the uh, the ambulance, and drove to the other part of the base. I had to go through an MP checkpoint because I was an ambulance. They waved me through. Put up, you know, assembled the bed, brought the ambulance back. I was the only one in the battalion that had a real bed. Anyway, a little new in there. So now. Uh, so finally, after my last mission as an Army reporter, I was sent for a day 
to get f stories and photos uh, at Firebase Ripcord. And so I got landed there on helicopter, went mission oriented, uh, got photos, got enough material for two stories. And I went there with enough water for one day and enough food for for one day. I had three s sets of sea rations. And uh, before the day ended, we got socked in, rain came, they couldn't resupply the base for, for about 10 days. We ran out of food within and water uh, within three days. So even though I had meals, three meals, I only ate one of them. I, I gave round, I, I, uh, I shared the other two meals with the other folks. And during that time, we did some combat patrols, enhanced uh, defensive positions. Um, and by the third day, we were so hungry, uh, with so lethargic, we really didn't do much. Uh, but after, finally, we got resupplied. Um, and I made it a point when the next morning, when it was going to be clear, I was going to be on that first bird out of there, because that was my very last mission in this combat zone. And uh, so when the Chinook helicopter landed, I ran. I was the first one aboard. I made it a point to sit next to Door because I had witnessed three other Chinook helicopters crash or be shot down. And, and they're made out of magnesium and they burn pretty quick. So I wanted to get out of there if it ever crashed or got shot. And so I got there. It was a nice, joyful ride. Another one of the B things. And uh, so, it's another bit of. Army humor. A few days later, I had to out process from the battalion, turn to my weapon, and I had to uh, check out at various agencies, including uh, the Tactical Operations Center. I had to get a security clearance. And as I'm, I give him my orders, and I'm signing out, and he's signing off the papers. And he says, Oh, he hands me the paper book. He says, Didn't you hear? Uh, all all separations are, are, have been suspended. We're invading Cambodia. Oh. So I whipped out my original orders. I said, read that. Doesn't that say I've been ordered to duty in South Vietnam? So, not, it doesn't say Cambodia, does it? So it gave me, started off in the papers and got me out of there. <laughs> so anyways, uh, a few days later, um, came time to, to leave the battalion, um, and so I went to the press office, brigade press office, at night to bid my friends goodbye. And one of my friends came back from the from an intelligence briefing. He says, "He says, well, our intelligence indicates we're going to be mortared tonight." You know, we had been that base camp had been attached so frequently. I knew about where the rounds were going to land, anyways. So I said, "Okay, stay safe." So I leave, and sure enough, I hear the thuds of from mortars being fired at us, and they're landing on the base camp. And the sirens are going off. The MPs are are, are chasing people into bunkers. I'm not me walking uh, back to my uh, my hoops to finish packing, and. Uh, I knew I was safe. They weren't going to hit this part of the base camp. So finally, two MPs jump out of a, a truck and says, "Get over in that bunker." So I, so I went in the bunker. And ironically, the, I felt sorry for the soldier. The sol I was in a soldier who had just arrived that day. Here I am leaving the next day. <laughs> the poor guy. And, and, and so uh, they all clear sounds. And so I go back. And next day, uh, go to phone. What was food by, and we just missed the final plane out, so we had to spend the night there. When you know it, my last night at this place, it was mortared, it was attacked, and they got mortars and and one M one twenty two rockets. Okay. So the next day we fly to Cameron Bay. There was a bottleneck of soldiers 
uh, getting out and flying to the States. So we were there for about five days. It was, it was a nice place. You, had a, you could swim in the uh, South China Sea, had a, had a nightclub with live music every day, huge PX. Uh, basically all you did was report in the morning, see if you were on the list to fly out that day, and then the rest of the day was yours. It was nice, peaceful, relaxing. That, my, my last night there, we, the Cameron Bay, which is very rare for this place, got mortared severely. And it hit the oil dump and right, right behind our barracks. And, and it blew up the petrol. It lit up the area like it was daylight. All the soldiers uh, about to leave and active duty folks are running and, and diving into bunkers. I'm just sitting there watching the spectacle say this beautiful. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> somehow I knew, it, you know, it, the rounds were not going to hit where I was. I had this instinct, and and uh, so each place on the way out, we came under enemy fire. So each, then we went to Fort Lewis, Lewis process out. Went to uh, went. I uh, flew to New York, then to Albany. Returned to my job, uh, and then a year later, uh, resumed my college education under the GI Bill. 1975, after I got my college out of the way, uh, I enlisted in the Guard. A um, friend of mine says, why don't you try this, try one program? Uh, and, and they also, I, was in, I left the Army as a Spec 4, and, and because I had, my con had combat experience, they could, I could come back as a sergeant. So that was a good enticement, so, so I uh, joined on. So, uh, I used my armored personnel carrier training, became a member of the 1st Battalion, 210th Armor out of Albany, New York, and was in that unit uh, through 79. Uh, in 1979, the prison guards went on strike in the state. So, my first activation as a reserve component soldier, I get this call to report to duty uh, to go to uh, Kriksaki Correctional Facility as a prison guard. So I called my wife's office. I said, uh, "Can you give my wife a message? Uh, I'm not. Go I won't be home. Uh, I'm going to jail." Because <laughs> yeah, I was activated. So that uh, that duty lasted uh, 19 days, and uh, and then I got an opportunity to uh, to join. 138th Public Affairs Detachment, because I really wanted to be more than just an armor. I wanted to be public affairs. I thought I could do better in public affairs. So I joined that um, and ended up uh, being the newspaper editor, uh, journal journalism trainer, uh, soldier skill training. I had the soldier skills. And a lot of these folks didn't have any soldier skills at all. And so I was there 79 through through 88, and during that time, I earned, and my soldiers earned 26 first place and other journalism awards, top awards for best paper, best feature writer, best photojournalist, best uh, news writing. And then I got an opportunity to be first sergeant in Army Reserve. Not, no, I'll take that back. Then I went to the 98th Training Division because it had a E7 Sergeant First Class slot. I would be the Public Affairs Supervisor uh, for the 98th Division. Now, before we go into that one, yeah. were you, when you were with the New York Army National Guard, did you do duty with the uh, Task Force Placid? No, no, because uh, uh, the bulk of the unit was assigned to do uh, M, uh, exercise called operation called Empire Glacier at Fort Drum when they had an unusual snow drought, mild weather. We were supposed to get winter training. It was in the 40s and 50s some days. Nice winter training. <laughs> some folks did go to uh, Lake Placid. All of us really wanted to do Lake Placid Olympic duty. 
That was a real that, that was a real mission instead of a training mission. And we were ready to do that. We could have done a good job there, but no. So we went there. So then in the 98th division, I became a whole bunch of things to uh, to include nuclear bombs with chemical warfare uh, sergeant. Um, had expertise in that. Um, public affairs supervisor. Uh, CTT combat training task trainer. Um, again, magic editor of the paper. And also I helped 98 Division establish a statewide uh, family support group network uh, based on my Vietnam War experience. So uh, the general asked me to, to help him do that right at the outbreak of, uh, of the Persian Gulf War. So right in the middle of uh, Operation Desert Shield, the war, war hadn't started yet. Um, not, uh, the Army had decided, had launched Operation Quicksilver. It was a down, downsizing of the military, including the reserve. The unit I was in was totally being eliminated. Um, and so I needed to find a new home, and I did pretty quickly with the 362nd Mobile Public Affairs Detachment, Manchester, New Hampshire. And so I transferred there. Uh, while there, the unit was activated four times for Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Desert Storm was the fighting part of, of the Persian Gulf War. Uh, first time uh, was to help establish a family support network Second time was uh, to help process soldiers who were being sent and coming back, or coming back. And the third time was a homecoming parade. And the fourth time was I was sent myself for 122 days as an individual. And um, while there, I was assigned to the 22nd Mobile Public Affairs Detachment, 101st Airborne Division. Talk about homecoming. That was a, the, the uh, replacement for the unit I had served with in Vietnam. And so they tasked me with putting together a group of journalists so the 22nd NPAC could go home. So I, they, they appointed me first sergeant, so I got a, a bunch of Army Reserve and active duty journalists together uh, for the PA mission for Operation Desert Storm and also putting out a weekly newspaper for the entire theater. And that was a joy, challenging climate, 123 degrees, 95 in the morning. Uh, that, was, that was pretty interesting. And then after that, I returned home to my job and family, back to uh, my reserve unit. And then it, Hurricane Andrew hit uh, Florida pretty bad. Uh, the Army Reserve pinpointed four of my soldiers, myself included, to go and help with rescue, uh, recovery, and relief. So we did that mission for about six weeks. Uh, that included establishment of a mobile radio station uh, so that uh, the hurricane victims could have information on about where to go uh, to for food, benefits, uh, and medical aid. Um, and again I was appointed managing editor of the task Force Andrew newspaper was a vindicator. And so then I ended up being first sergeant over a bunch of Army journalists again, active, actually 10th Mountain Division journalists and uh, Army Reserve and Guard journalists. And they were really a good professional group and so good that uh, we earned a Keith Delaware Award, the top Department of Defense Award for journalism. Uh, in, during a mission, during an active mission. And then go back to my reserve unit and we do our normal things, train, uh, produce magazines and newspapers, 
and then the Bosnian War broke out because we were C1 rated, the top combat readiness rating you can have. Uh, we were alerted for Operation Joint Guard, and uh, but before that, the day after Christmas, I received a call from Army Reserve, no, 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 Department of the Army Headquarters. It says, First Sergeant Brown, we need a first sergeant to go with a mobile public affairs unit that has no first sergeant. You are one of only three uh, in the reserve system that's qualified. And then I said, I said, okay, but I need 72 hours to do everything I need to do because I've been activated so many times. I knew what I needed to do to take, take care of my family and my employer. I said, oh. What we need you to report tomorrow. I, said, I really need 72 hours. He, he said, then I pointed out how uh, I'm already a veteran of a couple of wars. He says, you know what? I'm going to check with these other two folks. If neither of those two folks can do it, we're going to have to go back to you regardless. You know? And he said I was the number one choice. And uh, so they got, they called him back and said, we, we, we found someone. So I go back to my reserve unit. A few months later, we were alerted uh, for the next round in the Bosnian War. And so we had a good deal of training before. Uh, and the Army, Department of the Army, respected and responded to my request. Originally, we were going to be sent to Bosnia in March. And I pointed out to them, I said, I got four college students who are going to finalize their degrees this semester. Is there any chance we can go later? And they, they came back and they said July 10th. That enabled all these four students to finish their college education. Then we went to Fort Benning uh, for training uh, and resupply, issued weapons. We went to Bosnia. We did our Bosnia mission. We broke, my unit broke down into three units. Uh, headquarters, Public Affairs Office, Battlestar um, assignment, that's at the White House. Battlestar is where all the tactical operations center for the entire mission. And a third, uh, a third group was mission and print and broadcast oriented. Um, then we had a small cell in Sarajevo, a two-man cell. So basically that's what we did. Well, on top of that, the Army assigned me to oversee five other Army Reserve and Guard units. So I was an acting Sergeant Major. And also, eventually, within weeks, I was appointed Managing Editor of the Theater's newspaper. So. My day started at 5 in the morning, it would go to 10 at night, and over a nine month period I had one and a half days off. And because I had to go to so many different work sites, take care of so many soldiers, um, and it was a wonderful mission. Be part of NATO, be part of NATO's first uh, active operation. That was very historic. And a few days, about, about a month later, I had an opportunity to continue to serve or go, uh, or go inactive. My wife specifically asked that I go inactive. She said three wars was enough. Um, and so I put her first. If I put me first, I would continue to serve. And so I went inactive. And, and then, uh, then retired. Now, all through the time you were in the service, have you seen any major changes in the Army? Yes, there are several major historic improvements in the Army and in the Guard and the Reserve. Um, I can proudly say that I am a total force soldier, meaning I serve active duty Army National Guard and Army Reserve. 
those are three components. Uh, now, in when I first went in the guard, the guard was pretty much substandard. Didn't have to meet the same standard as the army, re, army active army, regarding weight standard, fitness, and combat readiness. So, uh, as the army moved to a more volunteer army, did away the draft, uh, and downsizing of the active army folks, deactivating a lot of units, became a greater reliance on the Guard and the Reserve in the event of uh, a national or international emergency. So the Army saw fit to shape up the Guard. It slowly but surely implemented total force concept, doctrine, to, to such a degree that there were several active Army divisions that had two active Army brigades, and the third one was the Guard Brigade. In New York State, the 27th uh, Infantry Brigade was part of the 10th Mountain Division for many, many years. Total force concept at play there. And when Desert, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, there was a need to respond. Active Army was not reluctant by this point. Uh, to tap the Garden Reserve. But I'll go, let me go back a little bit further. But also, it shaped up the Guard in that it required them to meet weight, fitness standards. Uh, the Guard was now, unlike before, required to take an annual two mile run test, push up test, and, and a um, sit up test. Secondly, had to meet weapons qualification standards without fail. And thirdly, receive training every year without fail on combat training tasks, your basic combat tasks to include first aid, uh, fire maneuver tactics, survivability, etc. So the training, the guard and reserve training and the active training pretty much all meeting the same standard. So consequently, in, in a proud way, today's Guard, as well as the Army Reserve, uh, are better ready to meet our needs. And I think the Army National Guard has never been more combat ready in the history of our country. Now, looking back over some of the materials that uh, we reviewed, uh, you're, you're modest. You didn't say anything about uh, your ability to disarm booby traps. Uh, How did you come about that skill? Well, came about that skill before I went to the Army. I noticed some things in life to include uh, finding things. Uh, if, you, if you look towards the sun and then look on the same angle as the sun and on the ground, if, if, if something glitters, it's metal. But by way of a reward, a lot of times that glitter back was money, was coins. So I became Mr. Lucky that way. So that's a skill I used in the military, using the sun and the moon to look out for booby traps and mines. Uh, also, I always had a natural knack of finding things, and it became very evident during training at Fort Pope. During, uh, at Fort Pope, you had to go through uh, a mock Vietnamese building and jungle, and there was a booby trap obstacle course. And going through that course, uh, I was the only one who detected all the booby traps to include mines, pressure detonated, uh, remotely detonated by wire and a firing pin, uh, uh, traps. The ground looks uh, ground looks uh, pretty even, but really, if you step on it, it, it's some kind of sinkhole. And at the bottom of the sinkhole, it could be sharpened, punchy bamboo sticks that could man or kill you, uh, and also unusual things in trees. And, 
So in Vietnam, when we were out on actual combat patrol, I had a very natural knack and discovered, detected a lot of booby traps to include mines, uh, pits, covered over pits, uh, sometimes uh, uh, things in tree to include uh, the triple wire, it would lo somehow lob a grenade down at you. Um, and camouflage wiring to mines and even gas canisters. So during the time I was on combat patrol, we had never been victimized by booby traps because for the most part I detected all the ones that were in our area of operation. Another great thing that I take satisfaction from doing uh, in Vietnam was responding, and helping rescue, shot down helicopter pilots, and sometimes recover bodies and wounded pilots. That there's a satisfaction with that. You're helping that soldier and their family back in the states. Now, were there ever any occasions uh, when there was periods of lulls there that uh, you had an opportunity to partake of USO shows? Uh, yes. Immediately upon arrival uh, at my base camp, Camp Evans, the second day there was a USO show. Uh, right, uh, Good rock and roll, good comedy, beautiful woman. You know, lots of guys got tired of looking at GIs all the time. Anyways, um, and well, the Army made a good attempt went at least every two months to have a USO show, but but when we were mission oriented in the jungle, we missed out because we stayed right in the jungle for about 92 straight days. We, we didn't have any shows during that period. And, th and then there was a period when they sent us a uh, place called Eagle Beach. It was an R&R &R center. Uh, they flew us there. It was right on the South China Sea. We could swim, play volleyball, watch movies at night, uh, eat and drink, whatever we wanted. They had cold beer, they had cold soda, had real food, I mean real food. So, you know, the, the Army didn't make it take opportunities to do that. However, whenever uh, we were mission oriented and the army flew in hot meals with ice cream. That was a tip off. The, the very next day we were going to go on a highly, highly dangerous mission where there was going to be a lot of enemy activity. So we, we picked up on the fact for some reason the army wanted us to have a good meal and ice cream before they sent us into harm's way. <laughs> Now, we, we always associate the military with having a lot of inspections and barracks cleanups and so forth. Did they have any of that uh, in there? Did you have to uh, stand up uh, for inspections? The high-ranking officials came come through now and then? Absolutely none, because with a combat zone, you're 100% tactical. They totally eliminate that Mickey Mouse stuff. But as an aside, so Lucius is fully aware. Everybody has loaded weapons, <laughs> but uh, but also for the most part, the, the soldiers were pretty disciplined, uh, and when they had time to be at base camp, uh, they picked up after themselves. They didn't litter, uh, you know, so it, it, it was self-policing. There was really no need for ins inspections, uh, although occasionally, when you were out in the jungle and you go for a period without firing your weapons. Uh, they have like a de facto inspection of your weapons in that they, they put all the soldiers uh, on a perimeter and tell everybody to fire for a minute to test their weapons and make sure uh, you know, they're, they're ready. And I'll never forget this one time we had a mad minute and 42 M16 jams out of more than 100 soldiers and thank God we, we weren't attacked 
then with 42 weapons that would not function. So that tip, the, the lesson learned from that is uh, a greater need to, to clean the weapon. And okay, now uh, what have you done since you've retired from the military service? Since I retired from the military service, um, my wife, bless her, gave me a Sheltie as an reti Army retirement present. So a good deal of my spare time is uh, playing and taking care of this stuff. By way of a positive note, uh, during my Vietnam War experience, I experienced a lot of trauma, saw a lot of death, recovered a lot of bodies. Uh, and so I pretty much suffered from post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and would have nightmares and have ups and downs in a mood way. Uh, but my wife noticed that since she gave me that dog, I have not had one relapse. So that's a positive thing in my life. Uh, and I enjoy, uh, enjoy my granddaughter um, and uh, family outings. And gone to Maine a lot, or two, two times a year at least. Uh, going to California, travel. Uh, finished my career at the time, Junior, retired. Year, year ago this April. Um, I help out at Grace Church, a food pantry. I'm vestry as a clerk. I play competitive volleyball twice a week. I still do my army fitness training um, five, at least five times a week. I run two miles five times a week, do push-ups and sit-ups almost every day. So that's a habit that hasn't broken. So, uh, And I enjoy reading. I enjoy a good movie. Uh, love the Yanks. Uh, looking forward to a couple weeks from now. Um, and I enjoy being kind and helping other folks, especially veterans. But but more importantly now, the thing I enjoy the most is writing a, a duty calls military column. Now, is there any one particular humorous situation that you recall from in the service? Yes. We've been in the jungle for a number of weeks, and finally a health app comes out with mail call. And in my bundle of mail, there's a box. And there's cookies and, and there's a magazine. There's a Playboy magazine. And all the soldiers in the million are oh, I can't wait till he gets done looking at it. And, you know, one of, them, one of them takes the magazine before I could see it. He goes through and he says, there are no pictures. My wife had cut out all the pictures. And, 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 then, and there was a note that said, said, you always told me you bought this because you like to read the articles. <laughs> uh, so another funny time happened during a, a combat patrol. We were in the thick jungle uh, after hours. We didn't see anything. We took a break. Um, we had security out. And suddenly there was this rustling in the brush. And it sounded like a squad of enemy soldiers heading our way. So we immediately got uh, combat oriented, ready for a fight. So the noise got bigger, louder, closer. It ended up being five uh, gorillas. Gorillas? Yeah. Gorillas. So that was uh, ended up being a hairy experience. <laughs> now, what about any military co uh, awards you have received? What do you, did you receive any from your service? Um, Bronze Star for Vietnam, uh, Meritorious Service Medal for, for Bosnia, four Army Accommodation Medals, I think four Army Achievement Medals, two Vietnamese Gallantry Crosses, three, uh, actually two Vietnamese, Gallantry unit citation, a presidential unit citation, um, and about 30 journal, Army Journalism Awards, and also uh, awards from the Veterans of Foreign Wars, American Legion, and I think one of my most joyous occasions occurred, you, you might have been there, uh, 
Kent, uh, at Columbia, Maryland, when Harry Summers, a famous uh, Army, a military journalist, syndicated journalist, but also a retired Army colonel, presented four first place awards to me. Uh, one was for best news writing, news writing, best uh, feature writing, best photojournalism, and best newspaper. And it came from a very honorable time. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and most of all for serving our country. You're welcome. Thank you.